Thank you, Donatella, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to, to warmly thank also uh, the agency for uh, this uh, event, for today's event, and especially having this focus on, uh, on railway, on this mean of transportation beside, uh, of course, uh, automotive and the other means. As said, I am, I am from SNCF, it's a French uh, railway national operator. And as an operator, railway operator, we are users already of uh, satellite uh, uh, services and uh, satellite uh, technologies, I would say. And uh, today in this uh, session, the coming session with the different uh, speakers, with the different pitches and the panelists and with uh, uh, Enrico just afterwards, we will have an overview of the of the usage and of the use case uh, in, from the space in the railway. But first of all, when we are talking about a railway, what is at stake, what is the purpose of this? Everybody knows it, of course, but it, I would like to remind it with some key figures. We are moving people and we are moving goods. Uh, in terms of uh, people, here the uh, uh, numbers and the figures are quite difficult to, to understand with the trillions of passenger kilometers, and I just wanted to translate them in some more comprehensive uh, figures. For instance, for passengers, let's imagine that on this earth, every human being, every man, every woman, every child is on board a train, and we all together are moving at a pace of one meter per minute. This is what we are doing if we take all the rays right from the world. One meter per minute, the whole humanity is moving. If I take a second example here for the freight, we are also a, a major uh, stakeholder regarding freight. This morning, uh, Ulrich Hermann uh, expressed the, 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 the figures from the, from the automotives, uh, and I will, I will take them uh, again. We are, let's say, shipping the equivalent of the whole European manufacturers card per year, the 20 million cars, we are shipping them to the moon. So let's imagine on our freight trains what we are doing. Uh, if I take another example, since I am uh, from Paris, uh, I will take the Eiffel Tower. An Eiffel Tower lasts 10,000 tolls. Just dismount an, an Eiffel Tower, put them in the in a container, take 3,000 of them and ship them to the moon. So you have an idea of what we are doing uh, with uh, freight and rail transportation. How do we perform this? We perform this with more than one million kilometers of railroads around the world. And if I take only European figures, we have somehow 80,000 uh, locomotives, electrical multiple units, passenger trains, but also also yellow fleet. So I only count here the, uh, the motored engines and not the coaches, of course. But this um, network has not been built in the uh, last decade. We are a two-century-old industry, a two-century-old business, which, in fact, has some very good genes, some very good roots. The success of this uh, industry relies on two very fundamental principles of the, let's say, the physics of the railway. On one hand, regarding energy, we are a very efficient energy tra transportation mean. Imagine again one single man with the two hands pushing a wagon of 15 tons, let's say 10 cars. You, you can push a single wagon on a track of 15 tons. This gives you a, a, an idea of uh, how efficient is the friction between the wheel and the track and the rail, which is a, a very tiny contact of something like one square centimeter, steel on steel, half of a stamp. The second fundamental property is guidance. We are a guided transportation system, and that is the difference to any other uh, uh, transportation system. We, we talked during lunch with some colleagues from uh, shipping, from maritime, and they said, yes, we have also a kind of virtual routes, virtual rails by, with our vessels. So we have 
a guidance and this guidance principles allows us to, for instance to have two trains, high speed trains crossing each other at more than 300 kilometers per hour with something like one meter distance between two of them. Try to do it with two cars, <laughs> it will be difficult. Again, also, if we uh, see uh, these principles, uh, thanks to this principle on mass transit lines, we are able to have lines on two tracks having more than one million passengers a day for urban traffic, typically. If you want to try to make the same with highways, you will need 50 or 60 lanes. Here, the very small footprint of the railway is also maybe part of the explanation of the, of the success. But railway is not only history and hopefully does not only rely on these two fundamental principles. Railway is also innovation. We onboarded new technologies. We, on, we, we moved from the steam machine to the diesel and to the electrical motor. We onboarded the new uh, uh, materials, we onboarded many new technologies, and for sure we will onboard, and we do onboard today also already, space technologies. If I just have a look in the last two decades, uh, with uh, a particular, let's say, domain of the railways, which is the signaling domain, uh, we onboarded many major evolutions. We moved from the analog uh, electromechanical or mechanical interlockings to the digital interlockings, already of course in the 90s, also for supervision and controls for regulation purpose. We also moved from the analog protection system for safe trans uh, separation for avoiding collision or derailment from the old analog system to the uh, new uh, digital and highly connected systems in mass transit as well as on high-speed lines. And uh, today the trend is to uh, upgrade the level of automation of these uh, train movements by introducing the automatic train operation, driving automatically the train, braking the train, stopping the train and so on, up to a very automated uh, uh, levels, we call them GOA4. Today, GOA4 is an unmanned system. That means there is no driver on board the train. Currently, this is more applied on mass transit line in urban lines than on high-speed lines. But in the future, yes, we may hope that uh, this kind of technology uh, will apply uh, largely also on the network. So, continuous innovation is also part of the railway system. If now I want to look into the future, in the next decades, and uh, for this I will rely on the European Rail Research Advisory Council, which produced a very interesting vision for 2050 and for the rail. There are three major, let's say, needs we want to target. First of all, the society needs, society's needs regarding people and connecting territories, economic needs and environmental needs. Regarding our society needs, of course we have to move people and we have to connect the, 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 the territories and the markets. And for this purpose, we will have to rely on safe, secured, performance and reliable uh, uh, transportation systems, automation. And of course also on interoperable uh, uh, systems allowing us to cross the borders. I took the train to join here from Paris to uh, Amsterdam first. Uh, years ago, there were several systems and switching. Now, there are still several systems, but we have a European train control system that allows to cross borders. We still have some national and legacy systems, but they will slowly disappear. So this is the vision also for 2050, to have a single European railway area. Regarding um, the economic growth, we are an industry. We are providing with our suppliers, with our OEM, uh, automated system, train control system, signaling systems, new energy with uh, battery trains and, and so on. So we are innovating, we are developing and we are deploying new solutions. 
And we have also champions in Europe that are able to export these solutions abroad, outside Europe. So we are part of this challenge, and the ERAC vision is that Europe will be very strong also in this domain. This also means, of course, skilled people, educated people, and uh, uh, very uh, uh, skilled jobs. And at last but not least, the uh, mobility is a very green mean of transportation, and we are part of the, of the Green Deal, which is one of our major tar targets. From the beginning, as I said, from the friction uh, 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 property, we are very good in terms of energy savings. And since we moved to electrical uh, supply years ago, also we are, uh, uh, from the greenhouse effect, uh, a very, 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 very good industry. But we can do more, and we will improve it also by uh, digitalization of the rail, and also, probably, with all of these topics, we will need the, head, the help of the space domain. There are some very interesting papers to support this vision, because 2050 seems to be very far away, but of course, hopefully, there are some intermediate steps. The Single Basic Act, the master plan at European level, shaped some, uh, draw some lines and some targets for us. But very concretely, last year, beginning 2022, there was a multi-annual work program produced by the Europe's Rail Joint Undertaking. The Europe's Rail Joint Undertaking says, yes, we have to introduce some radical changes in our system, in our railway systems. We have to tackle uh, IOTs, connectivity, train positioning, and in this paper, several times, and I checked carefully uh, this week and again, I searched for satellite, I searched for GNSS and so on, and I found several occurrences in this paper, which draws the strategy for the railway in the coming years. So we, are, we have to have a system vision for our railways, but in this system vision, we have to onboard new technical enablers, new solutions. And for sure, space is a provider of some of them. Let's see how space could help. And I will take this time the point of view of a railway operator from the operation or from the maintenance point of view with different domains. One very first domain is the infrastructure monitoring. Already mentioned today, but here applied to railways, that means we have to monitor veg vegetation growth, for instance, as well as landsliding. Vegetation, because due to vegetation, we have some fires starting, or we have some signals that are masking, masked by the vegetation, and the train driver cannot see it. So we have, uh, from the vegetation, also trees that could fall onto the overhead lines or the, or the track, so with a full disruption of the traffic. So here, Earth's observation is helping a lot for this, uh, for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of topic. Just at SNCA, for instance, track survey, the amount, the cost related to track survey is on conventional manner in, in, in the range of tens of millions euro yearly. Of, of course, we have also a major disruption due to landsliding. We had a big one a few months ago, completely disrupting the traffic between France and Italy to Modane. We can, thanks to uh, uh, radar uh, or infrared or uh, visual uh, signals from the satellite, and we use a Sentinel, we use this kind of, of, of solution, we can monitor the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the areas surrounding the, the track, monitoring the moisture in the ground, mo monitoring the, the change of land use, typically, that can also prevent risk according to uh, this major disease. Very close to the infrastructure monitoring topic, we have the asset management. Again, we can uh, observe from Earth and combine with connectivity, have a survey of the different assets, especially the civil and engineering structure and slow deformation, but also uh, including the bridges and, and so on. But there are some particular assets we are carefully 
uh, monitoring, like the level crossings, which are still causing a lot of accidents yearly, involving cars, trains, pedestrians, and so on. So here also, recent project demonstrated that there is a really added value to have the three domains working together, the automotive, the space domain, and the rail domain, to find a global system solution to, a, to, to this kind of, of problem. At the very center of, the, of this uh, uh, slide, I, I put communication. From the user point of view, we have to be in contact with the driver. We have to call the driver in, in certain situation, or he has to call us when, 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 in, in particular situation. We have the voice also with the passenger in some, uh, in some, uh, in, in, in some uh, kind of uh, railway systems. Increasing is also the data to be exchanged, not only for maintenance purpose, for monitoring, but also for train control system. I mentioned ERTMS, which is a data-driven system, but also for traffic supervision and more. And also many more uh, like uh, video, CCTV, and so on. So here again, uh, satellite communication, mentioned also this uh, morning in the roundtable, is seen also as a, as a, as a, as a complementary mean, if not the mean, to uh, the terrestrial uh, communication means. To bring robustness, to bring reliability, but also a geographic coverage where it's difficult to have terrestrial solutions. Logistic traffic and regulation. Here, the idea is, of course, to track the different wagons, the different trains, and more and more also to regulate and to command and to control, to deliver order on this kind of, uh, of assets, moving assets, let's say. From here, a, a, a control room, for instance. And at last, also very close to communication to, and to logistics, but closely related also to the, to the main domain, we have the signaling, which is probably the more demanding in terms of uh, data communication and train positioning of the, of the train. Typically here, we are uh, working on projects and already we have launched a lot of projects on, on topics related to train positioning, train control system, automated operation. And for this purpose, I will try to illustrate more in detail, based on this example, how we work together, space and rail, for a system vision of the railway. The example is the absolute safe train positioning, so it's quite easy to understand what it's about. First of all, I would like to say it's a major function of the system. I can imagine that in the future, in 2050, the, the, the railway system is a communication-based and localization-based system. For urban lines, we call it CBTC, communication-based train control. And this is uh, the, the way the different operators perform high level of, uh, of uh, headway and of commercial speed thanks to these solutions. And for sure, regional lines and high-speed lines will also move slowly to this, uh, to this kind of solution. So the idea is to have real precise, uh, real-time and precise accurate uh, positioning. Real-time means uh, a refresh, for instance, every seconds for, for tracking of, of, of the train. The main user are the operational control center for regulation purpose. It allows to, to detect delayed train, for instance. It allows also to uh, give priority in terms of conflicting rules when, when two trains are converging, uh, for instance, uh, on, on the same route. And from the safe train separation point of view, from the train protection point of view, avoid collision between trains, for instance, it allows to have a speed curve, speed controls, thanks to the, the position reported by the train. So the benefits are clearly, on one hand, if you combine this uh, uh, solution based on communication and train positioning with ATO, automatic driving, you may have energy savings in electric consumptions. For years now, we know in the railways, we have between, let's say, 15, 20% to 40% energy savings when we introduce accurate positioning combined with ATO systems and moving block. And regarding performance, not only regarding 
energy performance, but also the overhead commercial performance. This kind of system helps also to have a better headway, reduce the headway between two trains, and also increase the average commercial speed of the trains on the line, the, therefore reduce the traveling time. And uh, there are some other benefits. Some are non-technical, like the, uh, the cost reduction, remove some bellies, many bellies. We made a cost-benefit analysis at European level with the ERTMS user group early this year, showing uh, savings of around 10,000 euros a kilometer in CapEx, OPEX. And also, uh, we have also robustness on the line. If I take a second example here, moving to train localization as a primary mean to detect trains and do not rely as a primary mean on track circuit or axle counters, which is uh, the current technology uh, worldwide, we can also skip or, uh, and uh, uh, be more robust in case of track circuit failures, typically. So for this example, we worked together closely, rail and space, with this kind of roadmap. We have launched, and some projects are still ongoing, many projects also funded by Europe with the help of ESA, of USPA, of the agency. I will mention the EGNSS made project from our Swiss colleague with the German one, or the Klug project we, we have together, all together with the operators, Deutsche Bahn, S, uh, SBB, and SNCF, for instance, and some more. I will not mention them. We have to tackle many challenges, like track selectivity, accuracy, of course, but also confidence interval, safety, safety of life, still for in Senelec for railways. So this is why we have entered a second phase, a second phase starting this year, and I would say starting uh, last week on Wednesday with the, the kickoff of uh, EGNOS for Rail meeting with the agencies and with the railways suppliers and the railways operators, with the different stakeholders from the European Rail Agency and the space. And this is in the framework of, Europe, of Europe's way. I mentioned already the multi-annual work program written by the Europe's Rail. Here, we are talking about projects we have launched together with the sector. And we are targeting having this kind of SIL4 safety of life solution based on EGNOS typically by the end of the decade. So, to wrap up uh, this uh, short introduction, I would like to say that yes, railway is an industry innovating. And a railway is onboarding regularly new technologies. And the new technology we have identified today on the different topics from earth observation, telecom, or positioning can be based, is based on, on space. And the third thing is the key to achieve this kind of project is to closely collaborate together between our domains, the stakeholders from the space, stakeholders from the rail, involving also the suppliers. And this will be the key for our common success. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a good session regarding rail with our panelists and Enrico. The floor is yours. <laughs> Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, Stefan, for such an interesting presentation describing the overall rail sector and how rail applications can benefit from space technologies. Today, I would like to describe how ESA can support digitalization in rail. My name is Enrico Spinelli. I work as applications engineer in the commercialization directorate. And among other tasks, I oversee all the activities at ESA on railways. First of all, let me recall uh, along the lines of what Stefan said, why space is relevant to uh, rail. Uh, broadly speaking, we can say that the applications in rail can be uh, categorized in four main areas as reported in this slide. Signaling is the first one. As Stefan mentioned, GNSS with uh, absolute safe train positioning may allow for a reduction of the track side assets to be deployed along the line with considerable savings for infrastructure managers, may allow for increased capacity, 
may allow for uh, higher grades of automation. GNSS augmentation systems, and in particular interoperable GNSS augmentation systems like EGNOS in Europe, are necessary to comply with the safety requirements of the European Rail Traffic Management System, ERTMS. But also satellite communications in the context of the future railway mobile communication system, FRMCS, can be used together with terrestrial barriers in so-called multi-barrier solutions to provide the communications from train to ground. This reduces the need to deploy a, a dedicated mobile network for uh, uh, such communications along the railway line, the so-called GSMR. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, the fact that we can reduce the infrastructure to be deployed along the railway lines uh, makes the satellite ERTMS something uh, feasible also for the regional lines where the traditional ERTMS solution uh, would be too expensive. The second macro category is railway infrastructure monitoring. Here, space technologies again can facilitate such monitoring enhancing even, uh, allowing even uh, uh, predictive maintenance. In general terms, satellite earth observation data can provide a monitoring of the railway infrastructure and surrounding areas effectively on a global scale. Uh, typical examples uh, of applications include, uh, as also Stefan mentioned, monitoring of vegetation, actually prediction of the risks of vegetation encroachment, prediction of risks of flooding, prediction of landslides, and also a monitoring of ground deformations. Quite often, in situ or local measurements uh, in specific sites of interest can complement uh, earth observation data, for example, data from receivers, Genesis receivers on bridges. And thanks to satellite, typically IoT, Internet of Things, it's possible to gather information from several um, local sensors uh, mm, deployed on wide areas, also where there is no terrestrial coverage. Quite often also drones can complement uh, Earth observation data. The third macro category of applications is tracking and tracing. Here, GNSS and satellite IoT typically allow a number of applications in logistics. Uh, for example, moni tracking and monitoring the transport of goods continuously from source to destination, freight, or supporting truck workers' protection systems. The last macro category is services to passengers, notably broadband. We know that satellite uh, that terrestrial coverage may be limited. And also when it's available, uh, the traffic demand of train passengers may saturate uh, terrestrial cells. SATCOM can alleviate uh, such limitations by providing a dedicated capacity to train passengers uh, in a multi -barrier, uh, through multi-barrier solutions. Of course, uh, latency is a constraint, so low, low Earth orbit constellations are needed to support such applications. All of these are not just theoretical applications, are real use cases, real applications that uh, have been covered uh, from ESA through our programs and notably BAS. Now, developing and demonstrating a, a close to market application or service relies on using existing technologies and integrating existing technologies. But for some future applications, technologies may not be there or may be not uh, uh, mature. At ESA, we offer a wide range of programs that support companies to develop technologies from low to high maturity. Uh, companies can use our programs, for example, to start with a concept, develop a breadboard, then advance, build a prototype, a GNSS receiver for railways, then integrate technologies into a final product or service to be demonstrated and sold to customers. These programs can be used also by the railway community. And to make aware that this is a possibility, we created some years ago the Space for Rail initiative. With this initiative, we want to inform the railway community of how the ESA programs can be used to support digitalization in rail. You will find many programs. Some of them are in open competition, others are in direct negotiation. Bottom line, if the technology is not mature, 
activities are fully funded and awarded in open competition. If the technology or the service is more mature and close to market, activities are co-funded and procured in direct negotiation. Space technology means here satellite navigation like GPS, EGNOS, Galileo, but also commercial solutions like uh, uh, PPP or RTK. Satellite communications, typically from IoT up to broadband, commercial solutions, satellite earth observation, sentinels, as well as uh, commercial providers, and also human space flight technologies can, that can be used in railways. I will, uh, at this link, you will find all the programs like Navis, Pincubed, Artes. I will just now showcase a number of activities from low to high technology and service readiness level. Let's first, uh, the first ones will focus on signaling. Uh, the first activity is uh, from CGI and Nomad Digital, it's called Disruptive PNT Technologies for Future Railway Signaling Applications. This is procured under TDE-TRP, so Technology Development Element of ESA, that aims at testing the feasibility of prospective technologies for future applications. In this activity, the consortium is addressing scenarios that are very, very challenging today in railways and uh, enable uh, high grades of automation, what Stefan mentioned as GOA4, so driverless operations. There are conditions like start of mission where GNSS and uh, uh, sensors like inertial and rotationals are not enough to meet the stringent integrity requirements. The consortium is identifying, is investigating the suitability of 5G PRS positioning reference signals to address this scenario. The objective of this low, um, this low TRL, technology readiness level activity, is to uh, inform and prioritize follow-on activities to mature the technology uh, in a longer-term roadmap. If we now increase a bit the technology readiness, we end up in GSTP, the General um, Support Technology Program. This is a technology development program using space assets that helps companies to go and develop really mature pre-commercial uh, technologies. The element one is fully funded, so it's to mature the technology, not to a pre-commercial stage. Uh, under GSTP element one, we launched two parallel contracts to develop uh, a GNSS receiver technology enabler activity focusing on integrity specifically for railways. GNSS uh, uh, receivers technology is mature, but the use of GNSS in the complex rail environment is not due to multipath uh, interference, obstructions, and so on. That's why this activity. These activities address the two streams identified in Shift to Rail, the precursor of Europe's Rail, for the use of GNSS in ERTMS. Receiver for Rail from Itachi. Uh, is addressing stream one. For the expert, is the concept of a virtual balise detection using GNSS. GRIT with Airbus and the SNCF is addressing stream two, fail safe, standalone train positioning. The output of both streams will be taken into account in R2Data, the project mentioned by Stefan, in the efforts to propose some input for standardization, the TSI, Technical Standards of Interoperability. This is an example of how ESA programs can support the European efforts to define standards in coordination with Europe's Rail and also EUSPA. Another program that can be used to develop technologies is NAVISP. In particular, NAVISP, as said also this morning, is supports the generation of innovative concepts, techniques, technologies, and systems linked to PNT. The element two of NAVISP is for co-funded activities close to market. Uh, two examples always in the signaling domain. Voliera. Voliera is an activity led by Itachi for the development of a next generation lo location determination system based on a multi-sensor platform and specifically based on the integration of GNSS receiver with whistle odometry and LiDAR technologies. Uh, the activity is ongoing, following phase one completion successfully of a feasibility study. Uh, also, tools uh, for the certification of the system are being procured. This activity is in line with the stream one uh, concept I've just mentioned. 
EGN assessment is another very innovative novice element to activity for the development of GNSS localization for ETS, ETCS level 3, so including train integrity monitoring, and map-assisted sensor fusion algorithms to, to constrain the position of the train on the track. Very innovative, in simple terms, it may allow also for increasing the capacity, uh, special attention also to spoofing, uh, interference, jamming will be devoted in this activity that also will include the data collection with real data uh, to prove, to validate the system. This activity is led by SBB and today we have here Sebastian. We now move a bit further to the service demonstration domain and here I would like to propose to present two activities supported by BAS and by ARTES CNG Competitiveness and Growth that is a program to develop satellite communications technologies. The first project is SBS Rails 2.1 and is the last, I promise, uh, project on signaling. In this activity from Itachi, uh, together with the support of RFI, they are validating, they are demonstrating the ERTMS level 2 application on a real line, the RFI pilot line Novara Row, using virtual balise detection system with GNSS, augmented locally, and using even SATCOM in a multi barrier solution instead of GSMR. This activity capitalizes on previous TrainSat activity that, uh, that developed the near TMS like system that is in commercial operation in Australia. In SBS 2.1, they are also considering aspects of certification and uh, commissioning of the application. And today, this is the most mature uh, solution with the SEAL 4 train positioning system using virtual balise detection with GNSS. The other uh, uh, activity I wanted to present today is in another area, broadband to passengers, SODOR. Here, a consortium led by CGI with the support of OneWeb is trying to uh, demonstrate the use of a hybrid SATCOM and terrestrial communication system to provide broadband to passengers on a train. In the slide, you see a picture of a pilot that was performed successfully a few weeks ago, I would say, in, in UK. The first pilot in UK with OneWeb. The line was a specific one where the terrestrial coverage was very limited, 50 or 60 percent. CGI reported after the trial that with a hybrid system it was possible to provide connectivity to passengers almost 100 <coughs> percent. I remember that other trials are planned uh, with Network Rail in UK and other uh, uh, players in the years to come. And Garrett from CGI should be here. Here it is. As if you want to uh, approach him for questions, uh, he's more than uh, available to answer your queries. And finally, I would like to conclude with two success stories from BAS of uh, uh, florid and uh, uh, sustainable businesses. The first one is in the tracing and tracking domain. It's in the freight, specifically here, a Belgian company called Ovinto proposed to us some years ago a, a project, to, a demonstration project to develop a service to trace and monitor the transport of chemical products via freight. The transportation of chemical products is a challenge. Among many things, for example, radiation emissions are a hard constraint and typical uh, uh, mobile devices cannot be used. Ovinto managed to develop a specific platform using GNSS and satellite IoT complying with these radiation emission constraints and that also has a battery uh, lifetime of five years that is uh, compatible with the maintenance schedule of the, of the rail tank cars. This platform is to be installed on railway tank cars. Over the years, Ovinto, with our support, managed to pass from a simple service of uh, tracing and monitoring of chemical goods via freight to uh, having a, a larger set of services, uh, like a multi-service platform addressing the needs of all the stakeholders involved in the transportation. Uh, when uh, uh, the transportation of chemical goods is done, there can be up to 25 stakeholders. And now Vinto is able to provide, for example, digital transactions to any of these stakeholders at different 
point in time, providing digital billing uh, as soon as the goods are delivered, certification of cleaning of rail tank cars, and so on. The service is today used by 23 of the top 50 chemical players in the world, like Solvay, Evonio, uh, Ineos, Evonic, and so on. The last uh, success story from BAS I would like to report is uh, from LiveEO, and it's in the area of infrastructure monitoring. The German company LiveEO approached us uh, some years ago for a demonstration project called SIM. Here, basically, uh, they used the satellite Earth observation data together with artificial intelligence to develop an innovative solutions to monitor infrastructure. Could be railway, could be power lines, could be pipelines in general. The services that they have developed through our support are vegetation management and specifically prediction of uh, risks of vegetation encroachment and trees falling along the railway line. Third part interference, so monitoring the surrounding area of the railway line and ground deformation. Uh, this three, uh, they provide insights of these three services to the railway stakeholders, infrastructure managers, with a user-friendly web or mobile app that allows the infra managers to take the adequate actions on time. This service is now used by, for example, many players in the railway and energy domain, notably DB in Germany, where they actually monitor the vegetation risk of encroachment uh, for the entire 34,000 kilometers uh, network, uh, which is impressive. And also they are able to, to report the impact of storm damages uh, within 12 hours. Now, at ESA, we support companies not only through the programs I've just mentioned to develop technologies or services, but also through world-class laboratories. At ESTEC here, we have navig satellite navigation and satellite communications laboratory that can help you companies to test PNT and techno telecom technologies considering the specificity of the railway environment. Examples, fault injection testing. If you are interested, you can find more information on the point of contact at these links. And in the slide, you can see also, you can recognize many familiar people <laughs> that uh, from railway community visited the laboratory earlier this year. While supporting companies in the development of technology and services, at ESA we also are quite a lot active on standardization, notably EUG for ERTMS and ETSI, Railway Telecommunications, for FRMCS matters. Over the years, we have been interacting with many infrastructure managers, railway undertakings, as well as all the other European stakeholders like EUSPA, IRA, Europe's Rail, and uh, we have been discussing about the use of EGNOS in rail for signaling. Leveraging also on the ESA experience on designing, implementing, qualifying, testing, certifying EGNOS for aviation. Net result, a few days ago, as Stefan said, a, w a work breakdown structure has been agreed at Europe's rail level uh, to, to define the activities to introduce EGNOS in signaling. Uh, technical, ESA is contributing with all the other entities massively on technical activities, the one that you can find here in this slide, from EGNOS system definition up to testing, performance, and engineering, and means and tools. Finally, I would like to present some uh, opportunities open tailored for railway. While in the Space for Rail website, you can find all the programs that can be used uh, in general, also for the railway domain. This is a call for proposal that uh, address uh, the development of close-to-market applications and services using any space asset for railway. We don't look for R&D activity, no. We want to support innovative and sustainable businesses that really address needs from uh, infra managers or railway undertakings. Activities are, to be propo are proposed by companies, it's in direct negotiation, it's structured in three thematic domains that were defined in consultation with the key stakeholders. The first one is about uh, signaling. So here we invite companies to propose activities like, um, that are synergetic to the one addressed in Europe's rail, like onboard integrity proving and so on. The second one is improving the performance of railway so to address the needs of the infrastructure managers, proposals, like predictive maintenance, monitoring of assets, 
safety of workers or people, so optimization of logistics. The third one is improving attractiveness of railway, focus on the needs of the users, being freight or passengers. Intermodal applications can be supported. Uh, uh, innovative integrated ticketing before and after travel, smart stations, and so on. Activities are co-funded. You can find information at the link. Finally, last slide. These are two upcoming opportunities for railway. The first one is about uh, the use of uh, the, um, uh, the assessment about uh, the use of COTS component in a GNSS receiver. This is quite topical to reduce the overall costs of uh, uh, onboard solutions, for example. The second one is about the development of prototypes in terms of CD, uh, SDR, for example, to verify in an in end-to-end -end the satellite air interface, 5G satellite air interface, defined for FRMCS at Etsy Railway Telecommunications. They are expected to be issued end of the year, beginning of next year. This concludes my presentation. A few words. Uh, of course, again, I have to thank all the input from the different directorates that made this presentation possible. I can oversee all activities at ESA on rail only thanks to the good cooperation with anyone, any team. In particular, I have to thank Chris Willems from the Technical Directorate, and I would like also to, to recall the excellent cooperation with the USPA, specifically Daniel Lupur, that is here on all railway matters, uh, notably signaling. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Enrico, for your presentation. Now it's time for the round table. I would like to introduce the moderator for the next session, Didier Flamand, who is going to call on stage the, the speakers. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everybody. So it's my pleasure to, to uh, moderate this session. I am Didier Flamand, EGNOS project manager at ISA, working on ISA and on uh, safety of life and for aviation since more than 30 years and I'm very excited to contribute and participate to the introduction of EGNOS in rail. So I am inviting today for the round table Giuseppe, Franco, Sebastian, Dirk and Daniel. Okay, welcome, welcome to, to you. I will not introduce yourself, I will ask you to introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, sorry, so my first question is, uh, so please introduce yourself. I will start with Gi Giuseppe and then Franco. And uh, describe your organization, the, um, the, um, the role in the rail transportation domain and uh, you, for that, you have three minutes, and then we go to the second question. So, Giuseppe first. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Giuseppe Angelisanti, and uh, I'm responsible for a structure named the Connectivity, IoT, and Automation in uh, Ferrovia dello Stato Italiano. Ferrovia dello Stato Italiano is a group of company where each one has a specific role in the group, uh, and uh, the FS group governance uh, is organized in four business divisions, um, passengers, logistics, urban, and uh, infrastructure, where RFI, RFI, Rede Ferroviaria Italiana, is the business, business division leader. And um, mm, every company uh, has, uh, with every, for every business um, division, there are companies that, that share the same domain and uh, as uh, subsidiaries of FS Holding, they are homogeneous in terms of mission and goal, and they play a crucial role to develop the integrated infrastructure and uh, the mobility systems. Uh, the uh, FS Group 2023-2032 business plan foresees a, a, an important investment for, for the with a strong focus on digitalization and connectivity. Uh, it's a, they are very important for its 
essential development. And uh, um, the, the specific role of FS holding is to provide on the uh, guideline for all uh, growth companies and uh, to follow the specific project uh, in order to create uh, the essential synergies between the companies. Thank you, Giuseppe. Franco? Hey. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Franco Iacobini. I am the responsible of the infrastructure sector of the technical department of RFI, Rede Ferroviaria Italiana, that, as Giuseppe said, is the infrastructure manager of the Italian National Railway Network. What's our job? As uh, every, every infrastructure manager, we are the, our work is to ensure the availability in a safe way of the infrastructure, uh, railways infrastructure. This is a general way. What does it mean? It means that we have uh, to phase all the, first of all, we have to um, implement every activity of maintenance, uh, ordinary or thread ordinary, to ensure the, the, the safety of the infrastructure. We have to manage the circulation of trains in the safe way with the, the requested regularity. And we have to implement investment plans to improve the characteristics of the infrastructure and the technology used on the infrastructure. And also we are responsible for, as RFI, for the new investment for new lines. And then, another important thing, so we have, uh, as infrastructure manager, we have to face the natural hazards that we can find in the environment around us. We have to consider that Italy, our lines are along uh, more or less uh, uh, 17,000 17, of kilometers of railway lines uh, all over Italy. Italy, a, we say that's a country that uh, it's a very beautiful country, the country that we love, but uh, very beautiful, but it's a difficult country for many reasons, from, from hydrogeological risks, for seismic risk, for its characteristic and morphology. It means that we have to face uh, natural hazards as uh, um, hydrologi hydrogeological risk, hydraulic risk, floats, and everything is made more um, hard considering the climate change that is occurring in uh, that period. And so this is more or less the job we have to do. Thank you, Franco. Sebastian? Oh, there we go. Thank you, Didier. Uh, Sebastian from Swiss Federal Railway. Um, uh, thank you that we uh, can meet today here for the topic of EGNOS and also using satellite positioning in railways. Um, I'm uh, overseeing the localization topic within uh, Swiss Federal Railway since five years now, um, leading a team of eight people. And we want to bring uh, the GNSS usage within the command, control, and signaling. This is our goal. While this, um, today we uh, face many issues with uh, odometry. So this is the way how the distance is measured today in the ETCS system. And we, uh, as the first country in Europe, have been complete rollout of the ETCS uh, standard in, in Switzerland. So you think, oh, we are done in Switzerland now with ETCS, so we can uh, focus on other topics, but it's not this like this. We have still one third of our fleet that is not equipped with ETCS onboard units. And we have major uh, changes coming on b due to the topic of FRMCS, where the whole fleet needs uh, new onboard units. And for the time being, we talk about 300,000 per onboard unit. So if you have a train, you have two onboard uh, units, uh, you talk about half a million only for the train control and signaling system. And this is where our pain is because the time are getting shorter each time uh, where the technology is, the new technology is improving and we have to adapt because the trains need to be compatible to the track. So you cannot <laughs> say that there is only a track that is equipped with ETCS or the line. They need to work together and this is our, our mission and I'm very happy that uh, I can work in an integrated company where we also can talk with uh, the passengers uh, department that buy the trains so that we can find a way together 
to get out of uh, yeah, to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Dirk. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dirk Spiegel, and I'm uh, responsible for fully automated driving uh, within um, Deutsche Bahn, and there, especially the uh, infrastructure manager, DB Nets. Um, what is our biggest mission? As our colleagues uh, to the left I just mentioned, they are already deployed ETCS in Switzerland everywhere. In Germany, we are basically at the beginning of deploying ETCS. So therefore, the infrastructure has um, infrastructure manager has uh, formed a new group called the Digital Rail Germany to basically roll out ETCS everywhere in Germany and also to um, develop new system capabilities such as intelligent traffic control, move driving in minimal distance and fully automated driving. The biggest challenges we are facing at the moment is that our government uh, wants to play uh, plays a much larger role on the German railway. Um, so they actually want to double passenger, um, passenger kilometers by 2030 and also increase the freight um, share to 25%. And this basically means that we have to be more efficient on our given infrastructure because building new tracks takes a long time and, um, and uh, the capacity is already um, by far um, it's a capacity limit on, on the very um, important tracks. And thanks. Thank you, Dirk. No, Daniel, please, can you introduce yourself? First? Thank you, and uh, good afternoon once more again from my side, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Lopor, and I work for the European Union Agency for the Space Program. And as obvious already uh, from its name, uh, it is uh, somehow uh, responsible for uh, uh, progressing and providing the services of the European Union space program itself. Uh, the space program uh, responsibility mainly uh, is on the side of the European Commission, Directorate General for Defense, Industry and Space. And uh, we are helping them uh, to ensure that uh, Europe uh, can have uh, safe and secure uh, satellite navigation services and uh, as the agency we also support additional elements like for example the commercialization of uh, Galileo, EGNOS, uh, also Copernicus data and the services. Uh, we are also very active uh, nowadays um, starting to be active in the area of satellite communication which is uh, uh, quite a new topic uh, for us. Uh, unlike uh, European Space Agency we started with it uh, only a couple of months ago um, and uh, uh, we also outside of other elements uh, take care for example of the EU uh, SST uh, front desk. Uh, um, we are in charge uh, also of uh, providing uh, the security accreditation of all uh, space program elements uh, uh, in general, uh, so uh, including uh, the launches of satellites, etc. Uh, uh, the security side uh, uh, is covered uh, for uh, the space program by us. Uh, from the rail perspective, um, we work uh, since uh, many years uh, together with our colleagues from ESA and together with the main rail stakeholders on uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, many different uh, uh, applications. Uh, one of the key ones uh, which uh, is in our focus is of course uh, uh, as presented before uh, by Stefan uh, Calais from SNCF, uh, the part on the signaling, uh, but there is also a, ver a variety of additional applications like for example wagon telematics, etc., where uh, we play the role uh, for what concerns uh, the deployment of uh, GNSS. Uh, in the area of Copernicus, uh, we focus mainly uh, on uh, the uptake part uh, related to the infrastructure uh, maintenance uh, and for the uh, safe and secure telecommunication or SATCOM uh, in general, uh, we have the aim also to foster uh, and facilitate its adoption uh, in the future uh, uh, railway telecommunication standard called FRMCS, Future Rail Mobile Communication uh, system. Um, to conclude, um, as the agency, similarly as to ESA, we also fund research and development programs. Uh, uh, our uh, main one uh, is called uh, Horizon Europe at the moment, uh, uh, where some of the projects already mentioned here uh, uh, were funded from. Uh, I'm speaking about, uh, for example, ERSAT, or a very well-known project called STARS, uh, uh, or CLAC and CLAC2, uh, which is a currently running project funded by the European Union Agency for the Space Programme. 
Um, as we are here uh, for the commercialization days, uh, um, I would like to also mention that uh, from the perspective of the space program activities, uh, we have a dedicated program for startups uh, called uh, Cassini. Uh, with the objective to find uh, the first uh, European Union unicorn, taking advantage of uh, uh, the EU space program uh, for uh, their activities. So uh, uh, please don't hesitate and check uh, further details on our website and uh, uh, apply. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So thank you all. So uh, as you could see, uh, we have representative in several domains. So we're talking about infrastructure management, signaling, also, uh, connectivity has been addressed uh, already a bit. It's uh, a bit similar to what, uh, the, to what we heard this morning. So now I would like to come back on, for each of you to, uh, to go into a little bit more details about your needs and what you expect from, uh, from, from space in, your, in, each, in your domain, uh, being uh, infrastructure, connectivity, signaling, and so on. So, Josep? Um, to speak about the satellite utility, I would like to introduce the concept of connectivity in general and uh, uh, in the railway sector. Because in, in general, we, we need uh, of connectivity every moment because uh, around us everything is connected. And uh, the, the connectivity necessity is uh, growing day by day. So um, it's, it's very important to have the opportunity to be present uh, in a meeting uh, on the move, for example, on the train. And uh, um, today being connected uh, is not a problem for a good percentage of people, but nevertheless there are areas where no infrastructure is available. And uh, in this case is objectively complicated to obtain the same opportunity to connect people. <laughs> it's very easy to understand that a good portion of rail and the road, for a good portion of rail and road, there is no infrastructure, no connectivity infrastructure available. And the investment of over the last years and the new technology opened new frontiers. Today, using the satellite technology, it's possible to provide the connectivity coverage for a good portion of territory with only one satellite. To obtain the same results uh, for, with the, the terrestrial infrastructure, a very important investment would be necessary. Um, today, narrow band and broadband are easily accessible, and starting from the requirement, uh, we can consider the, the, the different uh, satellite, uh, the different uh, architecture, and uh, thinking to apply this uh, kind of satellite uh, to our use, specific use case. Uh, presently, we are thinking, for example, to use the uh, LEO satellite uh, to for the Wi-Fi on board the, the high-speed train, uh, but uh, we don't have uh, any inform information about the performance. So we would like to try this kind of uh, uh, use case. We are ready for, to start for new, new use case because we know that for IoT and automation, uh, uh, use cases are based, uh, we are ready with the technology, the space technology. We would like to try, we are ready to try new technology in a broadband uh, applications. Mm. Just one comment, maybe I'll give you the floor, Sebastian. Uh, this morning it was uh, uh, um, the uh, colleagues from the automotive insisted a lot about the uh, standardization also for connectivity. In this domain, what are your needs and what are your requirements, if I would say? Do you have the same, like automotive this morning, or? Yes, it's the same. The problem at the moment is the standardization. We don't have a standardization that can provide the service everywhere in the same situation, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, well, standardization is very important. 
Okay. Sebastian, you wanted to add something, maybe? Ah, yes, uh, on the topic of testing, uh, I just wanted to jump in because uh, testing is for us always very important. So um, me and my team, we run three measurement trains on the Swiss uh, normal network to measure the GPS reception. And it's also the two topics that we have in signaling. On the one side, we want to use uh, GNSS but on the other side, we also need to show the feasibility. So um, we are also providing a platform to uh, startups to test their sensors in the railway environment. Um, because on the one side, we need to show what is feasible on our network, and then we have to make it safe. So these are two steps. First, show that it's feasible, and then we have this EGNOS topic, for example, or the digital map topic, where we show how we add safety on this service. And I think this is the two-step approach we need for signaling. And just to give you an idea about what is our headache today in, in Switzerland, we try to build new lines, but there is no more land, so we cannot build uh, indefinite more lines, and we don't have as much money. So we want to shorten the headway times, but shorten the headway times in today's system is very expensive because we need so much trackside train detection uh, equipment. And due to this, we want to put this logic on the train. So from today, fixed block, we want to go to moving block. And this is our mission that we have to accomplish. And uh, we have to do it on the feasibility, on the safety side, and on the standardization side. So these are the three pillars which we need to be successful in. Franco, you wanted to? Yes. Yes, I think that from uh, the infrastructure manager point of view, the, 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 the principal matters in the basis are three. Connectivity, positioning, and navigation, obviously positioning, and uh, health observation. Speaking about technologies and the signaling systems, so I agree with the, the things said before, and uh, even, uh, even Stefan and uh, Rigo showed some interesting things. We have the ERTMS uh, system in our speed lines, and we maybe were the, the first country using the second level of ERS, uh, TMS of our high speed lines in 2005. But uh, to have a system, uh, such a kind of system, it means to have a lot of uh, transponders along our lines, aerobalizers, and uh, it means that to have many, many devices. And many things you have in your infrastructure, many day costs for maintenance, but for the, the improvement of the system and uh, for their availability, their availability. And so the solution could be, in this case, uh, we think so, to use the use of virtual balises and so passive system based on satellite communications in positioning in such a way to avoid to add so many um, devices uh, along our lines. We have to consider that the railway's environment is uh, really harsh in some way. And so we have a lot of costs. Stefan, uh, in his first intervention, showed something about reduction of costs. And the University of Milan, La Bicocca, calculated that we can have a saving of more or less of 40,000 of euros per kilometer in a reduction of a capex and opex for, for, for operation investment for every kilometer of uh, signaling system. And so we can have a save, we can have an improvement of the reliability of the system. What to say about uh, the, the, the program? Uh, for the, with this indication, uh, Italy started, considered as, indicated as uh, some the, the leader of this uh, changing in, um, in 2013, 10 years ago, with, uh, with, with, with our program, we tested the system uh, along the Cagliari San Gavino lines in Sardinia. We have the result. The results were good. The results are available for, for, for the agency. And then now we are uh, we're improving with the help of, of the agency, European and Italian Space Agency, with the program of um, certification of the system on the part of High Speed Lines Novara Road. This is part of the, the Torino Milano, Turin Milan, if you want, uh, lines, uh, speed, high, speed, high Speed Lines in Italy. What we need in this case? We need a standard. We need a standard in uh, interoperability. This is the request from the sector because obviously when we implement such a kind of a system, we need that the system can be in the shared and used by the, all the operators on the lines. We can consider that Europe is a, a unique, great, great network. And so we need, and so the, the request is to have a specific standards for this. 
but standards that are, um, uh, are agree and um, with, with the requirements in, in the field of security and safety, obviously, more than security, and the safety of the lines. We need the, 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 even uh, hardware and software that have the, the safety integrity level four, that's the maximum, because in science, only in this way you can ensure the safe running of the trains. But this is the first engineering. On the other side, we should say many, many things about the heart observation um, uh, for, for the, 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 the fight to, to, to face the, the, the great hazards. We took a part in several projects, as I showed by the RICO, about this, and uh, especially for landslides. We have many, many, as I said before, a lot of problems, hydrogeological problems in our lines, not only in the, the border between Italy and France, as Stefan showed it, but all the Italian country has this kind of problems. And so the interferometry, satellite interferometry radar could be a good solution to monitoring. Uh, we could speak many, uh, very much of the requirement. What, what we do, would like to have, the availability, obviously, of the, the data, uh, the good resolution with um, affordable costs, maybe, because if you, if you increase the, the resolution needed, it's very difficult to do have it. What is the characteristic of a satellite health observation? That we can have the, the data of a great, great part of the, the infrastructure of the country. Obviously, uh, if you have a wider area, we have a lower resolution. If we want to focus maybe for some specific uh, um, problem, such as he said, you can have a more precise uh, resolution. We can change, for instance, passing from the data from uh, the Sentinel 1, one uh, constellation, maybe from Cosmos KMED from Italian agency. That is a resolution uh, really, really higher than, uh, than the other one, but it's not available for all the infrastructure, but it's not possible for the costs of, uh, no, and for the enormous amount of data that you have to, to manage. And, uh, and, and this is other technology, obviously the problem is always the same, the control of the surrounding infrastructure for the new buildings, for instance, and the vegetation control. This is a very important uh, matter. I think that it can be an effort that um, put it together as, as Erigo showed for a specific, uh, for a specific um, program, putting together the radar observation and maybe other technology, maybe based on drones. But I don't know, this is the request. I would like to have such a kind of, uh, of uh, possibility. And, and I think this is all. And the, the last one, the last one, last word, the connectivity. The connectivity enable in a dramatic way, in a very strong way, all the monitoring system that you can have uh, on our lines. We are going towards the dig digitalization and so uh, the monitoring system are uh, always always more and more uh, improved on our lines, but the connectivity can become a problem. And maybe with the connectivity by satellite, we could solve the problem in such a way. Okay, Dirk. Um, yes. So what I've heard um, so far is that we talked a lot about um, safety and certification and so on. What I am actually missing is the whole topic of security. <laughs> Um, railway and especially the control and command system in, in Germany is part of the critical infrastructure and therefore now, especially um, since the last 21 months, has, has new requirements um, to ensure um, also a railway operation in, let's say, um, not, not very well defined conditions. And so um, my, my big hope would be that um, we not only focus on safety, um, to show that the trains are actually um, safe to run, also that we have a robust and secure system um, to handle also counter acts from from other areas. I, I think this yes. So you you should know, but uh, the um, the current uh, space infrastructure infrastructure that ESA is developing uh, with, with your spouse as operator as well is is a. Uh, is uh, by design now and also is including a lot of uh, devices and features to, uh, to reduce as much as possible the vulnerability uh, with respect to cyber security threats and so on. In particular on EGNOS we are now transitioning from the current EGNOS to the next one. With, with, we are adding a lot of, uh, of the requirements inside the design to, to, to cope with that. It's, it's also true for, for our partners who have the similar regional system, like in the US, in, the, in the India, in Japan, they, uh, all the systems are evolving rapidly now to integrate uh, 
what is needed to uh, to um, to counter and to be less vulnerable to to cyber security for the space component i'm talking huh? uh, one uh, important uh, interoperability has been mentioned uh, as you know we we are we are very sensitive to that because egnos is a regional system and there are others in the world which have which are based exactly on the same standard so this is aviation apparently simpler than rail because we have, we are lucky. We have ICAO. ICAO standard is mandated, and all countries have to comply. Why well, on rail? Starting with no, ERTMS is not new, but I, we, we are all convinced that it has to to be implemented for sure. It's a must. So maybe it's a good uh, timing to transition to you, Daniel. And your can you can you develop a bit? Uh, also, what uh, you you see as a um, member of USPA and how uh, the activities should be carried on in collaboration with uh, with these are all that. Um, thank you, Didier. Um, I agree, and uh, maybe we heard uh, correctly that there was a date mentioned when. Uh, um, Roughly, uh, uh, some more serious movement and building of the community towards uh, uh, ensuring that we can use uh, GNSS and ERTMS started was around 2013. Um, before that, uh, um, uh, I remember that there were projects running uh, in the frame of, for example, uh, FP6, uh, old framework programs and other uh, scattered uh, initiatives. Uh, but uh, uh, it's since 2013 that we are indeed collaborating together with the European Space Agency on the railway case. Uh, I mean, to link it more uh, with uh, the collaboration between the EU space program and ESA, we can clearly also mention uh, times that were before that, like uh, uh, in 2011, the declaration of EGNOS for the use of uh, uh, safety of life service in aviation. Uh, I think, Didier, that you were heavily involved in this yourself, and uh, it's uh, still considered as uh, one of the uh, major successes of, uh, of the EU space program. And uh, uh, to underline this, uh, um, the EGNOS uh, safety of life in aviation is not used only for I say quasi only you know, for commercial uh, air transport, uh, but it's also, for example, used in general aviation already or for non-instrument runways. It's really everywhere. So um, um, it doesn't only help to uh, save cost, but also uh, to save lives. Um, frankly speaking, coming back to rail, um, uh, between now and then, uh, nowadays we have a very strong community around uh, the case of uh, uh, satellite-based localization uh, in ERTMS and in the railways. Uh, it was gradually built uh, throughout the years uh, in course of uh, uh, the European Space Agency and EUSPAS research and development projects uh, uh, that started before the formulation of uh, shift to rail joint undertaking. Uh, what I see also right now is that uh, after, um, um, from shift to rail, um, uh, the agency became uh, uh, Europe's rail. Uh, there has been um, some steps uh, taken uh, in order to further uh, elaborate uh, on the need to harmonize and to ensure that uh, there are the necessary elements that help to facilitate the discussion around a wider railway table in order to harmonize the approach and include uh, uh, in practice the technologies uh, uh, into the future evolutions of ERTMS. And this is a very good news. Uh, uh, for, for this purpose, I would mention the structure uh, uh, composed of the innovation and the system pillar, where um, if you imagine um, the research and development activities that were introduced uh, uh, earlier by Enrico and uh, that I briefly touched also in conjunction with Horizon uh, uh, Europe uh, and other research programs are forming somehow the technical basis. But this basis is taken then further on by the innovation pillar of uh, Europe's rail, uh, where there is a broader railway discussion table that is able to harmonize uh, uh, the technical solutions and elements and agree on the final systematic steps in the system pillar to be then included into the TSI. So indeed, uh, um, outside of uh, the fact that now we have a very solid uh, uh, community working on the case, uh, there is also the relevant structure available in frame of uh, uh, Europe's rail in order to make this happen. 
Um, uh, it was already mentioned over here also by Enrico, and I think that you are, Didier, touching the point as well uh, with the current activities that we are jointly developing uh, between uh, the European Union Space Programme, ESA, the ERTMS Users Group, uh, uh, Europe's Rail ERA, and other stakeholders. And uh, this is uh, the already introduced work breakdown structure uh, on the, the delivery of an EGNOS uh, um, uh, demonstrator uh, for rail um, that should feed into uh, the Europe's Rail demonstrator starting in 2025. So in general terms, Europe's Rail is planning to start demonstrating EGNOS in 2025 and we are now working to make it happen uh, from the perspective of putting together uh, a solid demonstrator uh, that can be used. So uh, the cooperation again in this is absolutely clear, uh, like in the old days uh, in aviation domain. Um, and Didier, you are participating on it again, which is uh, uh, another guarantee for success. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, uh, we will be able to uh, move ahead uh, in the next year uh, and help the railways uh, also together with the railway state stakeholders uh, uh, to deliver. I think that we have a clear reason because, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, there has been several cost-benefit analysis in the past being made to this uh, uh, particular element. Uh, I would like to mention only one, and that is the latest one, made by the ERTMS Users Group Localization Working Group. Uh, it's publicly available on the EUG website, and the conclusion is that in Europe only, if we deploy GNSS for ERTMS, we can create cost savings in the order of magnitude of billions of euros for the taxpayers' money. So there is a reason why there is a community, there is a structure. So now it's only about the clear point that we have to somehow succeed. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before we, we go to the last uh, question, I just would like to dwell a little bit on what you started to address, both of you. Because with the, 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 the experience we have in aviation, the certification at the end, this is and the maintenance of the certification safety cases and so on. This has to be anticipated from the beginning. And so you mentioned testing, verification, qualification. So for aviation, we, we did it, and now it's, ma it's uh, maintained by USPA with the support of visa, all the safety cases. Can tell you this is huge documentation. I'm sure in the rail you have already have your models, your process. But here, you will integrate a space component and you are targeting very high level of safety, most mentioned by Stefan, by you, SIL-4, equivalent of DAL-B in aviation. And you mentioned testing. And so this is something we have to, we will have, to, not in the first step, but in the second step, to, to start thinking, preparing the, the tools and the means for, the, for this qualification end-to-end -end of your services, also for infrastructure, for signaling, for everything, and this is something very important. I'm sure you have already something because your services are already certified, but here you're integrating a space component, so this is very interesting. We'll discuss that later. So I'm coming now to the last question for each of you. So you have the opportunity today to, um, to send one request to space actors, uh, us, USPA, and industry. So, what would you be your requests, your very specific one? So, each of you, we can start with Dirk. So, so maybe I start and um, I, I make a very specific one. So, um, when we um, go into R&D projects, they usually have a runtime of two years. And everyone I know, I believe, who has already been part of the railway domain knows that two years is basically nothing. In two years, you can do your system design, you can purchase a couple of components and integrate them into the train and do all the certification tests of vibrating, fire, EMC, and so on. And the problem is, in the end, you only have a very short time to actually test the system on the train. Um, so if I have a wish, I would love that we prolong the, the project um, by another year so that we have much more time to test the systems under an R&D project. Thanks. We have heard about the business case and just to give you numbers, we have uh, 3,000 trains in Switzerland and 30,000 trackside train detection systems, so 10 times as many systems to detect where the train is than we have actually trains. 
And if we could reduce it all on the train, it would be a great beneficiary for our whole society. And to show the feasibility and also startups, uh, we need uh, industry also from the space sector to come to help us and to provide products because we as railway operators, we are not developing and uh, we are purchasing products, but we are not developing them by ourselves. Okay, very quickly, if we think to the health observation, it seems clear that we can have a great amount of data coming from a different system observation, but our problem is to, always the same problem, to transform the data and information and then in action when you had to do the, 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 with the result. And the request is to have tools, available tools for infrastructure manager, because we are not all uh, space specialists, but we are railways men, women and men, sorry, workers. And so and we think that it can be very useful to have uh, specific tools that can help us to manage the data especially if you think them in an optic of integration between different satellite drones and others. This is the request. Um, a close partnership between uh, the institutional actor and the transport, uh, transportation uh, service provider can, uh, can contribute uh, to the technological uh, development and um, with a, uh, a good benefit for the society. Um, I noted down a couple of requests and a, a consideration, but uh, my requests are, are easier. <laughs> um, can, we, can we facilitate collaboration between rail service provider and space company by pooling use cases or implemented ongoing solutions and these, these uh, Event is the first answer to my to my question to my request, and uh, the second one is: uh, Can we offer programs to fully understand the potential and the implementation of space technology in the service we provide? My my message could be uh, collaboration and information sharing, because uh, it's very important in order to accelerate the development of this kind of technology. Thank you. Uh, maybe I will uh, also react to the comment of Dirk. Uh, so um, I think that I should count with uh, one year extension of the clock too, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Okay, uh, so can I maybe turn the question a little bit around and have a wish uh, from the space side on the railway side? Would it be possible, Didier? You mean us asking? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you for the exception. Um, maybe you are aware that uh, in 2021 there was a resolution of the European Parliament uh, um, for uh, the ERTMS uh, um, uh, and its evolution as well, and uh, satellite-based localization was one of the points uh, mentioned over there. And another point uh, uh, that was mentioned in conjunction with this was that the European Parliament actually uh, is uh, looking at the EU railway industry to help facilitating uh, as soon as possible, um, the coupling between space and rail technologies in order to allow adoption of GNSS and ERTMS. Uh, um, now we are in 2023 at the end, and uh, we still have two technical solutions that are slightly different uh, and that are converging only very slowly. So my wish, uh, what I would like to ask the railway industry specifically is to uh, continue, if possible, on the debates uh, towards uh, um, listening to each other uh, rather than building uh, uh, separate solutions, trying to find convergence as much as possible. Um, we will, of course, uh, uh, as EUSPA, and I hope also uh, that is the same from the side of ESA, try to contribute from uh, our perspective, from the space perspective, to assist that. Uh, but uh, this issue uh, of the convergence uh, is a bit higher uh, in the food chain. Uh, it's more in the innovation and the system pillar uh, of um, uh, EU rail. And uh, I would like to wish that uh, this, as one of the last uh, small barriers, uh, uh, is soon 
eliminate it uh, to help us uh, facilitate uh, uh, as soon as possible the inclusion of GNSS in ERTMS with one uh, uh, single um, pan-European technical solution. Thank you. Yes, if just one last comment for me. So as I said, uh, we know very well the aviation world because we've been working with them for 30 years now, introducing EGNOS. So EGNOS is fully adopted and uh, all aviations are very happy with it. I'm convinced we can do it for rail, but I would, I would like to join what uh, Daniel is saying. When I started to, to, to see what, how your world is uh, working, my, my first reaction, oof, very, very complicated, very fragmented, very many, many actors, while aviation is much more simple. So this is one thing indeed uh, also you have to, to have in mind because uh, I, I've seen your time frame. Uh, if I remind you the past, but of course we are better now because we have, we have grown, we have learned a lot. But introduction of EGNOS in aviation, we started in 1992. And uh, service declared full, fully operational and, uh, and uh, certified by the relevant bodies in 2011. So, but we have learned a lot. Now we, now we know how to build a safety case. We know how to build all these files that in the end are mandatory to go in, the, in operations. So of course, this is something we are ready to, to, to share with you, we are ready to support. This is one of the objectives of the ERG WBS that we elaborated together with you. So this is very so some, something which you should not underestimate what it is. This is a message. And as I said before, I am very sensitive to what you say both. Testing, qualifying has to be done and to be done completely. Uh, uh, and this has to be anticipated in terms of development of tools, development of process for qu performance, qualification, engineering, and so on. Be you already have that because you have you are delivering services, but this will be the first time you will integrate a space component, a, sa a space safe component, which has been declared safe. And so this is my, my message to you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Now it's time for our startup pitches. I would like to welcome them with a nice round of applause. And uh, let's go f with the first one, which I believe is Intelligence on Wheels. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Thomas from Intelligent on Wheels, but what is much more important is the content. Uh, you might remember this picture, you might have seen it uh, earlier this year from uh, an accident in, in Greece on an ETCS level one equipped line. Um, is that a rare occasion? Unfortunately, it is not. We happen to have two uh, accidents of an ICE crashing into a uh, regional train last week, at least in Germany, just to give an example. Um, does it have to be that case? Our answer is no. Uh, we, um, about 20 years ago, um, came up at the German Aerospace Central with the idea of why not doing something similar, but was a great success in aviation, where they introduced a um, traffic collision avoidance system to aircraft, uh, mandatory in the eight, since the 80s now in every commercial airliner. Um, while we realized that the situation is finally pretty similar. So at the very end, uh, only the pilot in the aircraft or the driver in the train can avoid a collision when it is about to occur. It is just to be necessary to inform the drivers, the involved key persons. Uh, we came up with a system uh, which is uh, technology-wise challenging, of course, but uh, from, a, from a higher level perspective, rather simple. Just equip the trains with one more box, which is very, very cheap. Let the trains communicate among each other, 
directly, no base stations involved. So direct train to train communication as one of the key pillars. And of course, uh, a second pillar has been uh, discussed about a lot today, which is the localization. So the train should be able, the box inside the train should be able to localize the train in relation to the track um, sufficiently accurate in all cases and the like. So we came up with a solution like 15 years ago uh, when the uh, startup was founded. And I guess in this domain, we will be considered the next 20 years a startup as well uh, due to the habits of the railway domain. Um, the most important distinguishing factor between our technology and whatever you could imagine of and what is already there to protect from incidents like this is that we do not do anything in or along the infrastructure. We just equip the trains with some technology. And um, as I mentioned, uh, one uh, technology pillar is the localization. Uh, and here we can distinguish number one, that we have to have a, a digital map of the track network. And uh, you can imagine uh, this is something very difficult to get. Most of the operators, if not all, which we contacted so far, don't have an accurate, accurate enough, I should say, map of their own track networks. So our service is to bring it with our technology. And with that and a, and a, and a well-chosen sensor combination, sensor fusion approach, um, of course, making uh, highly use of Galileo and Agnos uh, since the beginning, but also um, uh, to IMU and other sensors. Together, and this is kind of the third element which is often forgotten, uh, a movement model of the trains. They don't move like cars. Um, they don't move like pedestrians. And all that enabled us to um, bring us a sense of fusion approach with, which works even inside tunnels. Uh, and if, if I say tunnels, you know that tunnels are the, the big issue for any space-based technology. And two years ago, we made a, a major breakthrough in, in also solving this issue for long tunnels, 10 kilometers and more. And we showed it in, in Germany, one of the longest tunnels, um, uh, where, we, where we used the system um, to make a, a, a switch of the lines inside the tunnels. Um, uh, with that technology where we use the magnetic sensor in combination with all the other mentioned sensors. If you would like to know more about this, just contact me. I'm here all day. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, all day we have heard a lot of innovations, a lot of nice technologies, a lot of nice new things in, in the rail industry, which are very great, which are very necessary for the infrastructure and hardware. But if you think about the software part, if you think about the end user and customer part, uh, we feel like rail industry is still 20 years behind the, the technology right now we have. I mean, maybe you may remember 20 years ago, how can we not track the, the cargo or how can we not get a good ETA calculation in the, um, in the, uh, in the, in the normal uh, car uh, driving? It's the same in the rail industry today. Um, and it's, it's very sad to say that rail industry is still in the 80s in that respect. But I'm very happy to, I'm very happy that today I heard two things that are really in the consideration of everyone. They're saying collaboration and better communication. So that's very good that uh, we are making progress. Um, in case of our point of view of talking about the rail in the past, we see a lot of analog way of handling things. We, we've seen today uh, we have all these high-tech trains, high-tech wagons, but we're still handling these wagon lists on paper written by hand. Uh, we have a lot of underutilized under, under resources. We have a lot of transparency issues in the shipment. Um, and, and there is almost no good digital way of access to the, uh, to the rail industry as well. Um, I mean, in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the morning, there was also uh, one sentence said, 
collaboration has to be provided by, um, um, sorry, in, in the morning there was another uh, sentence made, that, uh, the railway has very more effective energy consumption than the other, um, other industries, which is, which is very true. Um, and I can, I can confirm it with some numbers as well, as we see that railway needs six times less energy. And in the meanwhile, railway uh, creates nine times less carbon to the market as well. Um, and, and there are also some other effects that are really pushing every indust the industry to the, mar to the rail industry as well. Like, for instance, um, governments are putting more uh, taxes on the CO2 consumption. Uh, their road taxes are increasing. And the most important is that ecological changes. Huh? So ecological change is really pushing us that we need to go for the rail. And as rail flow, we see this as a kind of an advantage because there's a big gap in the market. Um, my name is Osman Akdemir. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Railflow. Um, as Railflow, we aim to create a platform that serves and better communication and collaboration to whole rail industry. We do that by providing our own solutions, but also integrating other uh, uh, partner solutions, because we know we can't solve everything ourselves, and we know that the whole market doesn't have a single point of access to all rail solutions. Um, and our goal is really to create a better collaboration and streamlined communication as well. And we, all, we want to make sure that the whole rail industry can fight with the CO2, can fight with the, uh, the climate change uh, challenges instead of fighting with the stupid data administration. Um, thanks to Raisu project, um, we are able to enhance this also in a good way because like today, many people talked about the collaboration is the key they have a lot of other innovations, a lot of uh, initiatives, a lot of uh, uh, nice uh, innovations, but the collaboration and the communication is not really in the optimum level. So what we want to achieve together with Reizu project is we want to make sure that we create a real specialized collaboration platform, which collects a lot of different data, and, and, and data is the most important part for a rail industry, in order to create, first of all, uh, visibility, second, better ETA calculations, and third, better collaboration. Because in rail, um, you need to make sure that the transparency from one hand to the other hand is going on time and, in, and going with the rail right information so that you can make sure that the operation runs smoothly. Most of you um, can think about, for instance, a delay in a trucking industry, like in the carrier world, a delay can, can have an impact of two, three hours. But in the rail industry, two, three hours a delay can uh, end up having a one or two days delay because there are a lot of stakeholders needs to be involved. So therefore, we want to make sure that all the signals coming from different sources, uh, from GPS devices, from GNSS, from uh, beacons, from all kinds of systems can be collected into one platform and we can easily give the digital access to other partners so that they can have a smoother operation. Thank you very much. Hello. Joel Corsa qui soc. Comme ça. Yes. No singing. Ah, yes. Good. So I am uh, president and founder of Syntony. We exist since uh, 2015, and I am happy to still be a startup because because I feel young. We are uh, th thanks to that. We are based in Toulouse, France, and we are specialized in GNSS technology. Uh, we have three main activities. First one is in uh, test and measurement. We are uh, <coughs> proposing <coughs> simulators, uh, GNSS simulators, in order to test receivers. And we are happy uh, <coughs> concerning uh, 5G NTN to have demonstrated, I guess, one of the first uh, 5G NTN plus uh, uh, GNSS simulation in uh, simulator in uh, in the ION uh, nav navigation uh, conference last September. Second point, we have a set of uh, uh, GNSS receiver embedded, and we are now 
embedding them in, in the rail and road domain. And finally, uh, some people begin to know this. Uh, we are providing a, a unique uh, in-tunnel precise location system based on GNSS. I will explain very shortly what it means. So when you develop an indoor location system, you have two ways of thinking. Either you say, OK, I will <coughs> base my system on a new uh, phenomenon, new uh, sensor, new acquisition. <coughs> or you think of what uh, everybody is using in order to be located, like a smartphone or like a GPS chipset. And then you say, OK. If I want everybody to be able to be, you, to be located, I want to emit this kind of uh, signal, which is obviously here, Genesis. We uh, have entered this domain thanks to the Stockholm subway. They wanted to locate people uh, only for safety. And then sometimes after, uh, rail actors came to us and saying, obviously, I want to locate my train, I want to locate uh, my subway, and not with uh, one meter or 10 meter precision, I want to locate my subway with 10 centimeter precision. So this is what we are doing with uh, major actors. I do not have the time to explain how it works, sorry. Concerning the receiver, we had also some kind of, we were kind of lucky because uh, we were called by uh, some of the actors here. I mean, for example, Klug Project and others uh, asking for our receiver. Why? Because our receiver has been de developed for uh, defense. It's full software defined radio, and then it's very easy to adapt it uh, to specific uh, either hybridization or, uh, or uh, map matching and so on. We have finally also a low power IoT tracker uh, working in the cloud. So we put a small uh, device in the container or uh, train uh, vehicle, and then it, it uh, will uh, not get uh, co compute the position on the board. The position will be uh, computed uh, in the cloud, meaning a division of the energy uh, which was. Uh, necessary by something like between 20 and 100, so very long uh, autonomy. All, all that makes our uh, <coughs> global panel uh, in which we are able to, uh, again, make GPS work, GPS Galileo work inside the tunnel, but also obviously uh, provide the corresponding receiver. So here it's an example with a road because we are also a um, member of 5GAA for an autonomous vehicle, but again, working for the same application in the, in the rail. Thank you. So as you may see on the screen, we are having a coffee break. And for those following us on Hisa TV, we reconvene at 3.30.